lesson 27. We'll finish, uh, we'll finish reading the Hatha Yoga Pradipika today. You'll receive one handout about Prajahara, and from now on you will receive handouts again every, every week. So we are in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika chapter 1, Sutra 50. Last week, we entered into the part where there were four exercises of Shiva being mentioned. Two of those we have had a look at already, and we will have a look at the other two now. The Sutra 50. Then the Shima Asana is described. Place the ankles below the groin on either side of the perineum, the right ankle on the left side, and the left ankle on the right. 51. Place the palms upon the knees, spread out the fingers, and with open mouth look at the tip of the nose with concentrated mind. 52. This is Simhasana, held in great esteem by the highest yogins. This most excellent asana facilitates the three bandhas. So this is the lion pose which is always done in the wrong way because it is interpreted literally. If you do it literally, it's big fun if you do yoga with children because what they tell you to do is this. And when you do that with kids, the whole room will explode, everybody have fun. But that is, of course, not what this is about. You already know what looking at the tip of the nose means. It means concentration on nada, on the center of the head. So, also very interesting, Sutra 52 tells us that this most excellent asana facilitates the three bandhas. Now that is special. The three bandhas, Jalandra Bandha, the throat lock, Mulla Bandha, the root lock, and uh, Uddiyana Bandha, the abdomen. So that is something that we need to look for, because these texts were not written with empty promises. If they say something, then that is part of the contents. So for most people not understanding the bandhas properly, they just overlook this kind of text. But that element should be there in what you do. It is a balancing pose. And if you follow the instructions, then you cross your ankles. But what is important, while you're balancing on your knees, you put your fingers to help you steady yourself, like the paws of, of a lion. But what is really important about this pose is that you you push up your tailbone, you open your throat, and you erect. Close your eyes, concentrate on nada. Now if you pay attention, you feel some coolness in your tailbone. If you pay attention, close your eyes, listen to nada, and observe. It's very subtle. Your throat is engaged, your belly is pulled backwards and you can feel some coolness on your tailbone. It's very subtle, but it's there. So like the other asanas described here, they're not just physical engagements. If you follow the instructions, you, you realize that they are all not just meditation exercises, but energy control exercises. Most of those exercises were Kundalini exercises to allow large amounts of uh, Shakti energy to rise. But here you have a very special one. It helps you to realize the three bandhas which you apply in your pranayama exercise.
53. Next, the Badrasana is described. Place the ankles below the groin on the sides of the perineum, the left ankle on the left and the right ankle on the right, sole to sole. 54. Then firmly hold the feet with the hands which are on their sides and remain motionless. This is Badrasana which destroys all diseases. Then yogins who have become siddhas, the yogins who have become siddhas call this Gorakshasana. Gorakshasana is one of those yogis that are at the very beginning of the lineage with, Mashe, with Shiva of course as the first and Machendra following after that. It's a classical stretch that many people do in the gym as a warming up. You join your foot soles, you pull your heels back as far as possible, and depending on flexibility in your legs and hips, you pull your knees down just as far as it reasonably goes. But what is important is that you do not sit with a hunched back, but that you actively erect your spine. Interesting about the uh, benefits of this pose, well, you have um, noticed before that um, um, the effects of asanas are usually focusing on certain diseases. This one says it destroys all diseases. So not one or two particular diseases, but all diseases which of course translates in increased health, overall health, which is resulting from increased energy in that ball of vitality in your belly that slowly starts to grow when you practice yoga regularly. The phenomenon that is called Dhanjan in Korea. This exercise involves very big muscles. One of the biggest muscles in the body is the thigh muscles. It takes time for those muscles to become more flexible and cooperate. I have, during some years, I've done this sitting against the wall and just stay like this for 10 minutes or longer, just to instead of forcing the knees down, just to allow time to do its work. What is not described here, but an element that is often added, is a forward bend. That you bend forward in the pose. You can feel when you when you bend forward, even if only just a little bit, that the intensity increases considerably. In modern terms, it's called the hip opener. The hips, the thighs, very strong, big muscles. Many people have stiffness in the hips because of issues in the lowest chakra, anxiety, um, things related to uh, daily life situations that we are often not even aware of. And those issues, when not addressed and when not conscious of, they become physical. They eventually translate into physical the obstacles in the energy circulation and the muscles become tighter, stiffer. So doing exercises like this, um, again, it's not just physical, it also leads to resolving those issues. In this case, issues related to fear and anxiety, worries and doubts about the present, but very much also about the future. Who does not worry about the future? Everybody does, it's natural. 
But if you're not aware of it, it can cause very deep issues inside you, psychologically. Fifty-five. Does the best of yogins being free of fatigue in practicing asana and bandhas should practice purification of the nadis, mudras, etc., and control of energy? So, Svatmarama here makes clear that your asana practice is only a preparation, while in most yoga classes. Asana practice is the goal, the end goal. Here it is only a beginning. Once he says you have practiced yoga to the extent that you are free of fatigue, so your physical condition and your energetic condition have um, improved considerably, then it's time to practice purification of the nadis, pranayama, the mudras, chapter 3, more powerful energy control exercises than compared with pranayama, etc. and control of energy. Meditation is also a form of energy control, by the way. When you just sit, concentrating on nada, if you stay put for a while and actually really actively concentrate on nada, you notice the intensity increasing. It is like as if your head becomes bigger and bigger. Your physical head, of course, does not change in size, but the ball of energy surrounding it does increase in size. And you, you experience that, you feel that as an increasing uh, size of your head. It almost feels like as if your head becomes bigger and your body becomes smaller. It's all about energy. Nada becomes more intense when you concentrate, which is also an indication that your energy circulation is accelerating. 60, 56. Asanas, <clears throat> the varieties of Kumbhaka, the pranayamas, the positions called mudra, then concentration upon the nada, inner sound, comprise the sequence of practice in hatha yoga. The concentration upon nada is mentioned again. Notice how many times it has been mentioned already in chapter one. While sadly most yoga teachers do not know what nada is. And you can feel from the text that actually nada is a central part of what we are doing. And it is not just a central part, it is part of higher yoga, of advanced yoga. Asana is basic. Pranayama is a little bit more than basic. The mudras become special. They are more powerful, but lastly mentioned is concentration on nada, which comprises the field of meditation. Meditation, by many people who teach meditation, is presented as something very difficult and very complicated. But it is not. Meditation is in fact very simple, but simple does not mean easy. But you remember when we started this course, meditation just started with observation, closing your eyes and simply be aware of what you hear, what you feel, what you smell. And when you get a grasp on that, you then slowly start to canalize the power of the thought, the power of the mind. And we have a powerful tool for that, nada. But you can, free, you can free wheel, with most people who claim to meditate actually are not really meditating, they sit with their eyes closed. 
and they are rather observing, freewheeling. But to make meditation really work and make it powerful, you need to canalize your thought. You need to focus on a point and stay there with your full attention. That is when meditation really starts to take off. It's not that sitting with your eyes closed and freewheeling is not good. It is good, it is very relaxing, but it also allows you to become aware of your subconscious thought processes. But there is just a higher step to take, and that is to take the bull by the horns, to take control, and actually start practicing mind control, thought control. Not, not complicated, but it is human nature to become easily distracted. And that is why it is not easy. But like with the body, when you start exercising, in the beginning it feels difficult and the body is not so cooperative. But if you continue, your body conditions, reconditions or conditions, and it starts to feel easier, lighter and better. You start to feel good. The mind is just the same. When the mind is not conditioned, it has a tendency to be scattered and distracted. And that is the condition most people are in. But when you start meditating, in the beginning, like with physical exercise, it feels difficult and maybe even impossible because the mind seems to have a, a will of its own. But if you practice and you continue to practice, you notice that it becomes easier to focus your mind and actually stay focused. In the same way that you start feeling physical exercise becoming easier when you continue to exercise. The mind functions in, in that regard in the same way as the body. You condition it by regular practice. When you stop practicing regularly, you lose that condition. Same as that you get out of shape when you stop exercising. The mind gets out of shape when you stop meditating. But then again, when you start again, just like with physical exercise, you easily and quickly recondition. Fifty-seven, the Brahmachari, who following a moderate diet is intent on yoga, renouncing the fruits of their actions, becomes a Siddha after a year. There need be no doubt about this. Brahmachari, that is, remember, what is a Brahmachari? The fourth Yama was Brahmacharya. And I explained that Brahmacharya means a person who dedicates themselves to the practice of a spiritual system. So anybody who sincerely devotes themselves to the practice of yoga is considered to be a Brahmacharya. Following a moderate diet and intent on yoga, renouncing the fruit of your actions, you become a Shida after a year. What is a Shida again? A Shida is a person who has increased consciousness, an awakened consciousness, which is accompanied by increased sensitivity. An increased sensitivity and consciousness leads to the manifestation of Siddhis. A Siddha is a person who possesses Siddhis, which are called, in, in uh, our language, are called supernatural and uh, paranormal abilities. 
which I said many times are actually not supernatural and paranormal. It's just that they don't manifest until you change your condition. But when they occur, they are very natural and very normal. Within a year, I experienced the changes that yoga brings about after the very first time that I practiced yoga. Of course, very small, but it is what made me fall in love with yoga. The feeling that I got from yoga, I didn't get from anything else, not from exercising, not from reading a book, not from anything else. So it starts at the very beginning. Renouncing the fruit of your labor, of your actions, that is a little bit difficult. Because when we do something, we have a goal. We have a desire to gain something from what we do. When you work, you expect a salary. You expect money in return. When you go to the gym to exercise, you expect your body to become more shapely, healthier, stronger. Often when we do something for somebody, we then also expect something in return. Now, to stay sattvic, because yoga is all about sattva, harmony, we have to learn to do some, to do things, not only yoga, here it is of course only about yoga, but we have to learn to do things without expecting something in return. Why is this important? When we expect something in return, we often end up frustrated, dissatisfied, because it doesn't end up the way that we hoped it would be or expected it would be. But when you do start doing things, when you start giving, when you start helping, when you start doing things just because it feels good, and you just do not expect things in return, things in return always come, but this time you do not demand or expect. So it leads to more opening up of the crown chakra because you feel grateful. You feel a great sense of accomplishment and satisfaction as a result of this new attitude. So when you practice yoga, if you practice yoga with all kinds of expectations, you'll never be satisfied. You'll always be Wanting more, you always be having desire because you're looking for a set goal, a set result, and it never turns out the way that you think or expect it to be. But if you just practice for the practice, just because it feels good in the moment that you do it. The rewards that come exceed your expectations, your possible expectations. They're more than you even dare dream of. That such is the, 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 the power of yoga. But it is like walking on a tightrope because you kind of disturb that process when you are full of desire, when you allow yourself to be disappointed because you expected more or you expected better. That is why in the very beginning, the basics of yoga is the study of the moral principles and precepts we learn about, control of our desire, and we also learn about the practice of contentment. Instead of being dissatisfied with what we don't have or what we don't get, we practice satisfaction with what we receive. 
gratitude with what we receive. And that just totally changes your psyche. It changes your dissatisfaction into happiness, into satisfaction. It's a complex issue, doing something without fruit of your labor, but it is an important thing to consider. It is an important thing to think about. And then try to put it into practice in daily life, at home, at work, with friends, neighbors, Fifty-eight, moderate diet, as mentioned in 57, is defined to mean agreeable and sweet food, leaving one-fourth of the stomach free, eaten to please Shiva, ignore as an offering. If you don't pay, if you don't understand the symbolism, you start approaching this again as a religion. And what many people do is they put an altar in their house. And while they eat, they will put food at the altar to please Shiva, which is God. But that is not what this means. It sounds wonderful that you have an altar with a Buddha statue and some candles and you put some of the food that you eat, you put at the altar, but that is superficial. It looks nice, it looks spiritual on the surface, but this has a very practical meaning. It says that you leave one-fourth of your stomach free to please Shiva. When you eat too much, it makes you tired. What does it mean? You destroy your valuable vital energy because digestion absorbs large amounts of energy. Everybody knows when you have a nice meal, and you take a second, surface, uh, a second serving because it's so delicious, you kind of crash after that. You need to rest. You drink a coffee, strong coffee, to get a little boost. But when you eat light and you don't eat until you're full, it doesn't affect you that much in terms of energy. That is why these dietary guidelines are given to keep your food light and small. So the last sentence says in between square brackets as an offering, please ignore that. You, this is not an instruction to make an altar in your house where you offer food. This is really about controlling how much food you eat so that you protect your valuable asset, which is energy. Fifty-nine. The following things are said to be not salutary. Things that are bitter, sour, pungent, salty, heating, green vegetables, and other than those ordained, sour gruel, sesame or mustard oil, sesame, mustard, alcohol, fish, flesh, including that of the goat, curds, buttermilk, horse gram, the fruit of the jujube, oil cake, asafoetida and garlic. All the foods that are mentioned here disturb sattva. 
they are either uh, tamas foods, in, in, in Asia you call it yang food or yin food. So they either cause uh, uh, a yang uh, domination, we call that rajas, um, making you restless, like caffeine does for example or red meat does for example but also spicy foods may cause that kind of rajas condition and there are also yin foods heavy foods fatty foods that can cause you to become to 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 have low levels of energy and um, um, make you feel make you feel heavy in the end, what, uh, what we are looking for, of course, is foods that leave us relatively sattvic. To get an idea, you can actually go to a, Korea, to a Korean temple. There are temples in Korea where you can walk in during lunchtime and have lunch. Then you get a Buddhist lunch, which exists out of... Uh, mainly uh, roots and seeds like grains and these, these kinds of staple foods and, and lots of roots and veggies that you also see in the Korean panchan uh, shops. No meat and hardly any seasoning. And yet, if the cook, if the chef does their job properly, it's still very tasty. They manage to make it delicious while maintaining, allowing you to maintain your sattvic condition. Interesting, the sutra says that you should not eat green vegetables, which means leaves like salad and ro Roman heart and, and spinach and, and all the leafy kind of vegetables. Now, we know that those are actually healthy. So why would a yoga book tell us that we should not eat green leaves? For that, you have to understand the function of leaves. Leaves come from a plant, but what do they do? Leaves convert sunlight into energy. Leaves are full of vitamins and minerals, but they are void or almost void of amino acids, proteins. Proteins sustain life, while vitamins and minerals are only additional requirements. That is why staple foods are all containing amino acids, proteins. We will come back to that in the next or the following sutra, one of the following sutras, because they indicate also what you should eat, what you should not eat and what you should eat. Green vegetables are healthy, but they should make only small part of your meal. So just having a salad as a meal without any proteins is not complete because it is lacking the building blocks that sustain life. Also, yoga suggests that you don't eat meat and other animal products. Now, people in the spiritual world often tell you that you must be a vegetarian because meat disturbs your condition. But the main reason for the suggestion in yoga to avoid meat is because of 
non-violence. If you eat meat, whether you kill the animal yourself or not, you are responsible for or an accomplice in the killing of a life. Non-violence means that we do not participate in such acts because ending a life means um, an act of violence. Now we live in very challenging times of course. 200 years ago there were no supermarkets. If you wanted to eat meat you probably had to kill it yourself. A chicken or a goat or a cow. You had to kill it yourself. You know, I have two dogs and they don't eat fruit and vegetables. I have to go to the butcher and, and get meat for them, which I mix with their dry food. And it, it breaks my heart every time I have to cut in that meat. But you can't be a radical. You cannot deny your dogs what they need to be healthy and not give them uh, uh, meat products. I, I have, to, otherwise I shouldn't have dogs. So what I'm trying to say is that being a vegetarian is something that you have to approach in a sensible way. I have tried to be a vegetarian for 20 years and it was detrimental to my health. It was, I was not healthy. I was emaciated, um, um, struggled with uh, depression. And at some point when I got really busy, I became exhausted. I went to a clinic to do a test. They, they drew blood and they checked all the elements of my um, from your blood they can see what you what you are lacking in terms of nutrition i was i was lacking everything basically practically everything everything that makes people healthy was lacking i ate too little but i also ate um, very poor vegetarian only vegetarian now vegetarian in itself is not poor if you have time to cook and you make sure that you get the proper ingredients. It just takes more effort than when you cook with meat. And I like to cook, but I'm not a person that spends three, four hours in the kitchen every day to make proper meals. So I was shortchanging myself in terms of nutrition. And I paid a high price for that. Many years of struggling with depression and eventually ending up um, with a burnout. So I started eating meat again, but very consciously. I don't eat large amounts of meat, but I know that I need it. And since I, since I have a more balanced diet, I feel just so much better. So to approach it in a, in, a, in a sensible way, if you do enjoy spending time in the kitchen, um, preparing a, a proper meals, I recommend that you try vegetarian meals. People in, in um, professional sports more and more switch to veganism because they clearly feel that if, of course, if the, the meals are properly prepared with all the uh, nutrients we need to function properly, they actually perform better compared to when they were still eating animal products. So it is healthy, but provided that you make sure that you get all the proper ingredients that you otherwise would need, would get from, from animal products. Sutra 60. Diets of the following nature should be avoided as unhealthy. Food that having once been cooked has grown cold and is heated again. Food that is dry, devoid of fat, or has an excess or, of salt or sourness that is bad or has too much of vegetables mixed with it. The, the vegetable thing is mentioned here again. 
food that having been once cooked, grown cold and heated again, that seems to imply that you should throw away your leftovers. But you have to understand that this was written in a time that there were no refrigerators. And food, when not refrigerated after it has been cooked, develops bacteria, develops germs that make the food become bad. When you eat it again, it can make you sick or even kill you. I never throw away food. I always put food that is not eaten back in the fridge. Out of respect. Out of respect for nature that has given me that food, that has provided me that food, the soil, the sun, the water, the work of the farmer to provide me with that food. But also the idea that there are still many people in this world that go to bed without food in their stomach, with, that go to bed being hungry. So this sutra does not mean that you should throw, throw away leftovers. You put it in the fridge. That is why we have fridges. Also, food that is devoid of fat. You know, I'm 57, 58. <laughs> I grew up in a time that fat was evil. Everything came into the market with li as light products and uh, low fat or free or fat products. Only to be rebuffed by modern research that says fat is very important for the functioning of your nerve system in your brain. We need fat. Whether that is plant fat or animal fat is not bad. Unless, of course, you consume it in excess. But fat is healthy. So they knew that already a thousand years ago when they wrote this book. <coughs> excess of salt. Salt, is, salt has a, a... Salt leads to high blood pressure because it... it the, the, the veins, the blood vessels, constrict as a result of salt. And when you eat too much salt um, on a regular basis, it can lead to very serious heart problems and death even. So too much salt, not healthy. High blood pressure also leads to many other health issues. 61. In the beginning, fire, women or men, and journeys should be avoided. For thus Goraksha says, association with bad company, fire, women or men, and long journeys, bathing early in the morning, fasting, etc., and hard physical activity should be avoided. What is this about? Explicitly mentioned in the beginning of your yoga journey. When you start practicing yoga, you turn your system upside down. You do things that your, your body and your mind is not used to. And that requires not only energy, extra energy, it requires lots of your attention. So all the elements that are described here are either to prevent you from getting distracted, distracted by, by your friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, partners, to exhaust yourself with hard work or other hard activities that absorb lots of energy, anything that just takes energy or attention away from your focus on your yoga practice. Especially in the beginning that is important, 
because you need to lay the foundation. And once you have, uh, once you settle down on your new, in your new uh, pattern of life, including yoga, then everything normalizes and there is no need anymore to avoid all these kind of elements. Fire here is about Manipura Chakra. That is why I didn't mention the phrases in between the square brackets basking near the fire during winter. It's not about physical fire or heat. 62. The following things are suitable to be taken by the yogin. Pay attention. Wheat. Rice, barley, the grain called sastika, and purified food, milk, ghee, brown sugar, butter, sugar candy, honey, dried ginger, the vegetable called pataloka, and the five pot herbs, green gram, and pure water. So, the foods suitable to be taken, not only by the yogi, but every human being. Can you see what the nature is of the foods described here, compared to the ones that we should avoid? They are all seeds, nuts, beets and roots. Why? The leaf of the plant converts the energy from the sun into nutrients, which are fed to where? To the roots, the beets, the seeds, etc. Our staple foods are all roots, beets, seeds, etc. Why is that important? because they, they contain all elements of life. That is a seed. What do you do with a seed if you don't eat it? It provides new life. You put it in soil, you give it water and it makes new life. Which is only possible if all the elements, all the nutrients that create life are present. And that is why the focus of a meal should be on those staple foods. Green vegetables are healthy, but they should only be a side next to your staple foods that make out the majority of what you eat. So rice, also bread. In Europe we eat bread, not just bread, but most of the bread that we eat is made from grain, not the, what do you call it, the, um, white, white flour misses all the important ingredients that we need to feed ourselves. Most of the bread that we consume is whole wheat bread. Just like brown rice, it's a seed that contains all the, the nutrients to sustain life. And very importantly, it contains all the amino acids that we need to sustain life. I was looking for the word processed. Of course, there's bread made, made from processed uh, uh, flour. With white bread, that is not so healthy, but you use white, uh, white flour mainly for pastries and those kind of things, the luxuries that you buy at the bakery shop, but most of the bread is baked with um, whole wheat flour. For this reason, milk, ghee, brown sugar, butter, sugar, candy and honey. You would not expect to see that in the diet of a yogi, or would you? But the thing is, milk, ghee, brown sugar, 
sugar candy and honey, they were the power foods of the past. Not only were they the power foods of the past, they were rare. People didn't have the luxury to consume these kind of foods. They were rare or they were very expensive, difficult to get. But when you practice yoga, when you decide to follow the spiritual path, the last thing you should be worried about is proper nutrition. You just have to have a stable, a stable regular intake of uh, high, high nutri highly nutritious food. We live now in a time that you are told not to have too much uh, dairy products. Ghee is also a dairy product, it's clarified butter, uh, sugar of course. But that is because our diets already contain so much of these products that we don't need any more of it, we need less of it. But thousand years ago when this book was written, people had too little of it. And having a little bit of these products, a little bit of dairy, sugar, honey, would improve their health, would increase, improve people's condition. Now we live in a time where it's actually detrimental to our condition. It's a luxury problem that we are dealing with. 63. The yogin should take nourishing and sweet food mixed with ghee and milk. It should nourish the datus and be pleasing and suitable. It's kind of the story that I'm trying you to, to tell you in the past couple of sutras. It's very important is nu nutrition. And here he mentions the datus. You probably don't remember. But the seven datus are symbolically represented in Muladhara Chakra. So that was in lesson 13 when we discussed the first chakra. Maybe you remember I mentioned that one of the symbols in the chakra is an elephant with seven trunks. Each trunk represents one of the building blocks of which our bodies are built. Blood, plasma, no, plasma, blood, uh, I think they're mentioned here, muscle tissue, fat tissue, bone tissue, brain, marrow, nerves, and semen. These are the seven datus. So it should nourish the datus. It should be supportive of all our physical and mental functions. Sixty-four. Any person who is not lethargic in the pursuit of different forms of yoga attains perfection. Siddhi. Through practice. Be he or she young, old, or even very old, sickly or weak. <clears throat> Practice makes perfect comes to mind, but also very important, nothing is achieved if we don't have the discipline to practice on a regular basis. Yoga presents us with a wonderful view, a wonderful promise. Better health, more energy, uh, increased awareness and sensitivity, consciousness. But it also says you have to do something for it. Otherwise, you will not have all those benefits. So if you're not lethargic in the pursuit of different forms of yoga, you attain perfection. Perfection, I have mentioned before, is uh, 
not the perfection that most people think about, that comes with a tension, an ugly tension often. It is the perfection of the restoration of all our physical and men mental functions that in most people are at a low level of functioning because of the, the lack of energy. That is perfection. Perfection is the restoration of all our functions to its normal, natural level. Interesting also is that it is inclusive of everybody, whether you're young, old, or even very old, sick or weak. Anybody can practice yoga, can do yoga, practice and study. Anybody, everybody will benefit from it. Even more, moreover, if you are old or sick or weak, you will benefit even more from it than somebody who is young and still full of vitality and health. Throughout all those years that I've been teaching yoga, I have had people coming to me with an interest in yoga, but then they have doubt. They say, will I be able to do yoga because I'm stiff? Will I be able to do yoga because I'm old? Or I have a disease, can I do yoga? And my answer is always, yes, especially you can benefit from practicing yoga. But keep in mind, it's not about perfection, it is about enjoying what you do. Don't push yourself too much, don't um, uh, be impatient, just enjoy what you do. And don't compare yourself with other practitioners who may be better than you. And of course it is even better if you join the course because there you learn everything you need to know to approach it in the proper way. 65. One who is intent on practice will obtain Siddhi, not one who is idle. Yoga Siddhi is not obtained by a mere reading of the scriptures. It's an extension of 64. If only you practice on a fairly regular basis, you will have enormous benefit from what you do. He calls it Siddhi or perfection. That is the condition where you simply function in a more optimal way compared to your old condition or the condition of the people around you. Also significant is yoga siddhi is not obtained by a mere reading of the scriptures. And this, <coughs> this brings us to the problem that we have with many yoga books. Many yoga books are written by people who they have studied uh, Sanskrit, they have studied ancient languages, and they take it upon themselves to, to translate a book that deals with a practical science. So they are reading something that they have not experienced themselves and then they have to translate that into another language, interpret what the text means also because these texts are symbolical. And that is simply not possible if you have not yourself experienced how it works. And people often ask me, especially before the start of a course, they want to prepare and they say, can you advise me some books that I can read in preparation before the course starts? And I say, no, I will send you some PDF files and for the rest, just, just attend the course. That is where you will learn everything you need to know. And why do I say that? Because more, almost all the books that I have 
try to read only lead to confusion because they were written by people who have not deeply who do not have a lifelong experience of how yoga works who then write books who in my eyes appear to be full of nonsense because it is not in line with what I have experienced during 40 years of yoga practice that is what this means Ajita I, it makes me smile when I read it every time Ajita's, did you see Ajita's comment? he wrote that didn't Jesus have something against scholars as well? Jesus was also a man of practice he stood in the middle of life and he had arguments if you read the Bible he had arguments with with the, pan, the, the pundits or the pandits the scholars in the same way that Buddha also had his conflicts with the pandits in India because they theorize everything without actually practically knowing what they're talking about and with certain sciences maybe that is correct and that is possible but yoga is a practical science and you cannot describe it if you haven't experienced it yourself 66 continues with this Siddhi is not achieved by wearing the dress of a yogi or by talking about it practice alone is the cause of success this is the truth without doubt and this always brings me back to the yoga weekend in an island on an island in the northern part of the Netherlands we have several islands there stretching out to Germany we had a yoga weekend there and there were like uh, 50 people or so so Ajita was, was busy with one group and then he told somebody else to take care of the other group and there was this lady who was just a beginner in yoga who was completely dressed up like a yogi with a turban around her head and a, and a, a dress around her shoulders all in white beautiful but she made terrible mistakes she was so busy with her ego how she looked like what she looked like that what she did with the group was not correct kind of foolish even that is what this means it doesn't matter actually I would dare to say if you look at if you look at spiritual circles spiritual communities you always see that the leader stands out they have an unkempt beard they have wild hair or they have a ponytail or they the way they dress does not allow you to overlook them which means they are there saying hey here I am look at me I'm special but a real yogi, if a real yogi would walk in the street in Myeongdong, busy place, you wouldn't recognize the person as such. That person would just look like any other person. Why? Well, wearing of the cloth of a yogi doesn't make you a yogi. Wearing of the portraying yourself as being something doesn't mean that you are something it is not about the outside it's about the content and that also means if you're really functioning in the crown chakra if you're really a yogi or a spiritual person it would feel it would feel wrong from the beginning to try to impress people with your appearance because you wear a fancy cloth or a funny hair do or the way that you portray yourself because that is ego related and one of the biggest issues in spirituality not only yoga is dealing with ego not being controlled by it 
that's what this sutra conveys. There are many. You know, there is a, there is, there is a documentary. Uh, Kumar? It's on, it's on YouTube. Kumar. I think it's Kumar. I, I will look it up in the, in the break. Kumar is a story about an Indian guy who was born in the United States and he works in the IT industry in Silicon Valley. But he looks like an Indian. And so looking at what is happening in his country and in, 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 in the world basically, with yoga becoming so popular, he started to notice that the spiritual world is full of frauds, full of fake people. And the documentary is about him going to prove that the world is full of fake spiritual people. So what does he do? He looks like an Indian, so he starts to grow a beard, he puts a turban on his head, puts on a red dress, adopts a funny accent, and he, he, he starts going around proclaiming to be a yogi. But he also visits other people who claim to be spiritually highly developed and he exposes them for the frauds that they are. Kumar, it's called Kumar. I hope you can watch the documentary. Last time I looked it up, but we'll have a look at it during the break. But it, it tells you every, it, actually, that is the warnings that, that Swatmarama here is giving. Um, it's about content, it's not about outlook. It's not about ego. The last sutra, and the end of chapter one, the asanas, the different kumbhakas, and the excellent karanas are all in the course of hatha yoga to be practiced till the fruit of raja yoga is obtained. That is clear. Practice, practice, practice. Not in a fanatic way, but following your feeling. And discipline is necessary, but rigid discipline will destroy your good intention. What allows you to have a healthy form of discipline to practice yoga regularly is the, the motivation that you get from feeling good. You practice yoga, you feel good, you want to do it again naturally, without force. I started like that. Because it felt good. And I went through the process that I skipped sometimes. And every time that I skipped, my day just felt different. My condition just felt different. And it made me determined to do it again tomorrow. And I learned also to practice contentment in that way. Sometimes you just have to let it go. Sometimes you just have to allow yourself to relax, to not practice. And maybe eat something extra or drink a glass of beer or wine. You enjoy that, don't regret. But tomorrow you will want to practice again just because, just because it feels good. Alright, let's have a short break.